After last week, let's hope, let's please all hope, that the vast majority of Rampage episodes going forward will stick to the one hour format. I know some of you are obsessed with AEW or obsessed with watching as much wrestling as you possibly can, but who the hell wants another two hour wrestling show on a Friday night? Especially if you've already watched two hours of SmackDown before that. Now I get some of you will say, well, I don't watch SmackDown every week, so this is my wrestling fix on Friday night. Well, do you need it to be two hours and to start at 10 p.m. Eastern? Probably not. I'm just saying. Because, like last week, it was a really damn dragged out snore of a show. Like, you had good stuff in it, but like you could cut out all the other crap and have a fantastic one-hour episode of Rampage. When it's only an hour, if it's a good show, it feels even better. When it's a so-so or average show, it could still feel good because you only sunk an hour into it. Or when it's a bad show, you could still say to yourself, ah, at least it was only an hour and get them next time. So let's continue to do this. Now, you know, there's kind of a standard format or theme that you're seeing develop in the show, which feels right in terms of the one hour format is that you get three kind of notable or somewhat marquee matches of differing varying levels of importance. And that certainly held true this week. First, you start off with Brian Danielson versus Nick Jackson. <laughs> Brian Danielson said, I ain't doing the last match, brother. <laughs> I'm going to be on the match in the segment that's the most watched, which especially if I know as this is being taped Wednesday for Friday, then by God, yeah, we're going to go first. That's right. Best politician in the game today, Brian Danielson, 2024. How could you consider yourself a Brian Danielson fan if you weren't for voting for him for president? I mean, who's a better politician out there right now? What, Trump? Biden? DeSantis? Kamala? You're fucking insane. Brian Danielson gets stuff done. Yeah. As far as getting past the silliness of me, um, I like the potential approach of him having to go through the elite and working through one member at a time to get back to Kenny Omega. You know, it has some old school kind of NWO vibes when you think about like staying and spending a year going through the NWO to get to Hogan. You know, that, that, I, could, that I could get behind, although I wonder if that's really where they're going to go with this, is where they should be going with this. I will say Danielson seems to be determined to have his chest red as fuck after every match, and I don't know why. Must be something that he enjoys. I will say for Brian Danielson is that I see him in a slightly different light in AEW, and here's what I mean, is that he's out from the WWE where he's always going to be the plucky kind of, I can do it underdog, and he's here presented in a way that he's legit and he's more serious, and he's kind of almost presented as a form of a badass in terms of he can take anybody out, he can make anybody tap. Now, if he was in a company full of 300, 320 pound beefed up dudes, like I would laugh at that. I'd say that's freaking stupid. Not believable that he could do it with all of them all the time. But in a company like this, especially when you look at who is being featured right now on the top in the main event scene, it actually works quite well for Brian Danielson. So I really don't have any qualms with that. Uh, match was solid, even though, yes, it involved one of the bucks that sucked, Nick Jackson, but they had enough of Brian Danielson in there, obviously, to balance it out and make it not be such a flippy, kicky, twisty spot fest. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the dual submission spot, when you've got, of course, you always got to fucking feature Jungle Boy. This company is just obsessed with this dude, and I don't get it. Like, he's vanilla. He is bland as fuck. There are other people that you can put into this spotlight. Give this spot, and they would do much more with it, I promise you. But it's almost like the leadership of AEW wants to push a guy like this because deep down a lot of the fans of AEW want to be having guys like this push because they say, you know, he has no personality, he has no charisma, he can't talk, he's just like me. And I could sit there and say, oh, it's like I'm a wrestler and I could do big things. Come on, man. The dual submission spot, I understand it's tying into the match, a tag match on Dynamite, but here's the thing. It's like the second time in a row you've had a Brian Danielson match and with some other bullshit. You don't always need to do that. Sometimes just stay in the lane of the moment of what's going on and let it be. Or just flat out let Danielson get his ass kicked. 
I build some heat on the supposed heels. The dual submission stuff like <laughs> Brian Danielson 2024. He's going to make sure he looks good. By God, I respect him for it. Yeah. Uh, then go from this to the Ricky Starks vignette. That looked great. Uh, made Starks look legit. That's the type of stuff that you do when you're trying to present somebody seriously, present them like they're a big deal, present them like they're a main event type player. And for AEW down the road, Starks absolutely can be, should be, and had better be. Um, of course, you have plenty of clowns <laughs> because we're talking about wrestling and we're talking about wrestling Twitter especially. They're going to be like, Hook! Oh my God, it's Hook! Oh my God, it's Hook! No, this is about Ricky Starks. Focus on Ricky Starks. He's the real talent here. CM Punk's promo package, you know, it certainly seems like they're course correcting here, and that's a good thing. Because the whole good vibes of, hey, it's CM Punk, we're happy to see him, like, that goes away quickly. And it's not the best utilization for Punk. It's not the best return on the investment for the surely massive amount of money that Tony Khan, AEW, are paying CM Punk to be there. You need to get more on that investment, more than what you have been getting so far to date. As a result, it is time to course correct, it is time to do some different shit. And I'm certainly eager to see what will come next for CM Punk. Um, the match, obviously, I was looking forward to the most on this show was the women's triple threat, Jade Cargill, Thunder Rosa, Nyla Rose. This match should have been on Dynamite. Why do I say that? Because more people watch Dynamite. <clears throat> this is a type of match featuring two future big-time players for your company and Jade Cargill and Thunder Rosa that should be on the show that has more viewers. Plain and simple. Like, you look at Jade Cargill and you look at Thunder Rosa and you can see it. Nyla Rose, just, I'm sadly, kind of there, frankly. But this show, this match, should have been on the bigger show. Especially when you look at the fact that on the more watched show, a match featuring Penelope Ford was featured. How the hell does that make any goddamn sense? But as I'm looking at this match, I was thinking to myself, and I tweeted about this during the show on Friday night. Like, there's so much more to Jade Cargill than just being the, you know built up Amazon sexy goddess of my dream. She's not just the sexy ass storm cosplay girl. She's not just some Serena Williams type of like athletic genetic freak. She's not just that. And the presentation of what you're getting with her is mostly just focused on that. And we need to see AEW get better about telling the stories of these people and telling the stories of these characters and presenting them in different ways. You look at Jade Cargill, you could do so much more to tell her story, the nuances, the layers, the onions, and not just brief mentions in passing, but actually like build off of it. She's a former D1 athlete, if I'm not mistaken. I think she went to, what, Jacksonville? So she was um, like all conference, I think, in the Atlantic Sun, if my memory serves me correctly. Pretty sure she's got at least a bachelor's in psychology. I think she might even have a master's in psychology. So you've been talking about Britt Baker, DMD. Why can't you talk about Jade in a similar type of light? You know, she's got that. She's got legit athletic credentials. She's got college graduate on the resume. She's a freaking model and internet influencer. She's also a mom and she's done all of this shit before the age of 30. Like she's not even 30 yet. Like, that's the type of stuff we should be telling the story of. That's the way we should be presenting a character like a Jade Cargill. Because that's the type of shit that will help even more fans connect with her. You can feel it, you can sense it, you can see it. Like, the AEW audience wants to fully embrace her, wants to fully get behind her. So give them a reason to. And a similar thing with Thunder Rosa with the shoot fight background. They've made mention to it and alluded to it before, but they should be doing more to tell the story of Thunder Rosa. Because you look at these two ladies, they can certainly be a major importance to this company now and especially in the future. They can appeal to underappreciated, underrepresented demographics, underappealed to demographics when you look at the fans that are actually watching all egg white wrestling. It's not just about all leg white because of the majority of the people being featured at the top of the card. It's also a reflection of the fan base and who's actually watching the shows. You do better to feature these two ladies they, and tell their story and get people connected and emotionally invested in them. Not only can they be two of the big stars of your women's division, they can be two of the big stars of your company and big draws for you. Like That should be the focus. And I get why you might have Jay Cargill pin Thunder Rosa here. Like you set the tone for 
later on, maybe Thunder Rosa gets the belt from Britt Baker, and now Jay can say that I, I deserve a shot because I've beaten you before. Personally, that's not how I would have done it, but I could see it. I could understand it. doesn't mean I agree with it, but... Um, but these two should be feuding at some point in time in the future, one-on-one, -on -one, and it should involve a title, and no, it shouldn't involve the fucking TBS title. It should be for the AEW Women's Championship. Yeah. And as far as the thing some of you are going to point out, like, hey, there's a reason you don't go all that way with Jade yet because she's green as shit. A couple of things. Yeah, number one, she is green as shit. Number two, more than half of this damn roster doesn't belong on television on a primetime national wrestling show right now. Let's keep it 100% real and legit. They can't work crisply enough, effectively enough, execute well enough, safely enough to where you should feel proud about them being shown on TV. A lot of them aren't ready for primetime players. That's a reality. So what makes her any different? Two, the whole thing with the chair shots. Yeah, that looked really bad. And you know what? You can get away with it a little bit with her, but even more so, stop putting her in a position where if she can't execute it well, then you don't fucking do it. You have a Nyla Rose maybe do something like that. You don't have to have Jade do some shit like that. You don't book to weaknesses. You book to strengths. You maximize and accentuate strengths, not mask them. You don't accentuate negativity. That's bad booking, and that's on Tony Khan. But that match, again, was solid and should have been on Dynamite where more people can see it. Malachi's Black's message, like, who gives a shit? You know, this is all about Cody Rhodes just needs to stop being so goddamn stubborn and stupid about this and just turn heel already. Just do it. Just do it. And the main event of this show was another gimmick match. And, like, even before that, they teased the whole thing about the casino ladder match for Dynamite. And I get next week it's the two-year anniversary, and it's a proud moment, and the company should celebrate, and the fans of the company should celebrate because they made it two years. Like, there are a lot of things going against them. And just because you have billionaire financing behind you doesn't automatically mean any type of long-term success is guaranteed. So it is an exciting thing. It is an exciting moment. But you look at this, and it's like just another reminder of there's always got to be some type of gimmick and some type of shtick. And the reality is when you talk about AEW right now, the only thing that's grown in the past couple of months is their payroll significantly. All these people they brought in have not moved the needle significantly. They have not. You still haven't caught up to the viewership of the debut episode two years ago. And any bump that you've received for bringing in some of the names like Punk and Danielson and Cole has been small and not sizable and not significant and not incredibly steady. And you keep hovering just a little bit over 1.1 million viewers and what happens if you settle down a little bit more? And you've been throwing a lot of gimmicks the past month or two to try and keep popping those ratings. Dixie would be proud of you. The point I'm getting at here is you gotta figure out how to run the operation a little more BAU and you can't have your BAU so be, be so heavily gimmick based. Because at some point in time, you get a diminishing return. At some point in time, you also present these really shitty gimmicks like Orange Cassidy versus Jack Evans in a hair match. Who the hell wanted to see this? Who gives a shit about Jack Evans losing his hair? Why is Orange Cassidy wasting his time here when I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he's still like number one or number two in the AEW rankings? Shouldn't he be going after Kenny Omega in a world title shot? Like just, yeah. Like you have Matt Hardy and this is how you utilize him? Another reminder of just because you bring in a bunch of people, that doesn't guarantee anything. It doesn't mean that they know what the hell they're doing. I thought WWE didn't know how to utilize Matt Hardy. This company's doing the same fucking thing. It's crazy. But this main event match was kind of dumb and you know, dark order my ass. Like, it didn't matter. Like, who gives a crap? Too many people being featured, too much crap, too many gimmicks. Like, cut it out. This is where you're substituting for your inability to write. This is where you're substituting for your lack of ability to tell coherent, cohesive, engaging stories. Shows like this one and main events like this one point to that. So again, the good thing was the show was only an hour. Two of the matches connected. So that's not bad. Much, much better than last week's show. I promise you that much. But that main event, oh God is a representation of many of the things that are currently wrong, in my opinion, when it comes to AEW. There's plenty of good, and there's also plenty of bad, just like that main event. 